win, win. There is another thing, and I speak to you as I've always done in these meetings, very openly and bluntly. There is a huge vacuum where labor is collapsing. You can see it. And that means that the radical independence campaign, which has been brilliant so far, has to think hard in the coming decade, let me say, or five years, to see how that vacuum of the absence of any force which openly defends the ideas of socialism in working people can be recreated in Scotland, but this time in a completely different way. I think that is a responsibility. Not now, but in the years that will uh, uh, follow. And given the fact that the Scottish Parliament is elected on the basis of proportional representation, unlike the Westminster Parliament, perfectly reasonable in my opinion, for candidates to stand up defending these particular views, who are also, of course, for independence, because the aim should be to create a Scottish Assembly, to elect a Scottish Assembly, in which 90% of the elected MSPs are for independence. That will then virtually become a de facto situation from which it will be difficult for Westminster to pull out. So these are some of the tasks that stare us in the face. And if we show the same vision, you, if you show the same vision that you have done until now, I don't think victory is that far off. Two other points I want to emphasize briefly. One, you know, I am horrified, and this is a general problem, not just in Scotland, but all over Europe, is that history is increasingly hidden from people, especially radical history. They are not taught it. They don't know about it. I remember coming to Scotland about, I don't know, I come here often eight, nine years ago to do a program for the BBC uh, on my beliefs or non-beliefs or whatever it was. Uh, you know, it was the, their version of Desert Island Discs. And they said, what music would you like? So I chose appropriate pieces of music. But then I said, I want to hear John McGrath's John McLean song, sung by, or Hamish Henderson's song, a song I even named the singer. And I'm not kidding, the researcher who was talking to me at the other end, they, she said, who's Hamish Henderson? So I said, explain. I said, and then she said, I hope you don't mind my asking, but who's John McLean? I said, I actually do mind your asking. <laughs> because you should know who John McLean is. He's one of the heroes of Scotland. And I remembered him this year when this semi-chauvinistic celebration of the First World War was taking place. Once again, trying to rewrite the history of what was an ugly, vicious war fought to build empires of war. And John McLean, who refused to fight in the war, stood in the dock of a Glasgow court explaining why and saying, I will not fight for a capitalism dripping with blood from head to foot. That, if that had been the answer of the entire working class of these islands, we would have had a revolution. And you can go back beyond that. I was handed a book by an old friend earlier. I haven't managed to read it. <laughs> but it's The Liberty Tree, the stirring story of Thomas Muir in Scotland's first fight for democracy. Where Thomas Muir, excited, encouraged by the French Revolution, started a campaign for one man, one vote. Unfortunately, it wasn't one, every one person, one vote, but those were 
different times. One man, one vote. Adult franchise, male franchise for Scotland. A revolutionary demand at the time. What did they do to him, the rulers of this country? They arrested him for sedition. He said in court, like John McLean, but in 1793, I have devoted myself to the cause of the people. It is a good cause. It shall ultimately prevail. It shall finally triumph. And for that and numerous other things he's done, he was put in chains and packed off to Botany Bay in Australia like many other dissidents from this country and from, from, from the United Kingdom, so to speak. So this history is extremely important because to try and wipe out history, the young generations growing up now have no idea what happened just in the middle of the last century. Because some of these ideas, just knowing that these things were possible, is considered subversive. Bernie talked about the National Health Service. But you know, Britain wasn't very well off after the war. It was a devastated society, destroyed by the war. Hardly any money in the bank. The treasury was bankrupt. Yet, despite all that, Attlee and Nybevan insisted that Britons had to have a health service free at the point of production free for every single person. They would no longer have to pay money for medicine. Where did they find the money from? They found it. It was there. And there is even more money now in the coffers of the state, which they spend on wars and other things, and bribing each other. <laughs> Nine billion, they see the health service in a crisis. Nine billion allocated to the health service is going to go in the pockets of private companies because they've privatized sections of the health service. And I tell you one thing very easily that an independent Scotland could and should do is set up a nationalized pharmaceutical industry that produces all the medicines. It's no big secret. A tiny island like Cuba does it. A tiny island like Cuba, which has the best health service in most of the world, not the whole world, I won't say that, which has a preemptive health service where people are seen regularly and they have their own pharmaceutical industry. So the costs are kept low. They don't have to pay the giant pharmaceutical. Or as now is being put here, like in the States, insurance companies. And people who are buying these privatized sections of the health service and who will tomorrow control it are Bupa and the big American health giants. So it's not that nothing can be done. Start can be made. Lastly, we talk a lot about Europe. And I've always been for being part of Europe, just as an internationalist. But I have to say that the Europe we have got today is a Europe run by bankers. <laughs> a banker's ramp controls Europe in league with the politicians of the extreme center, and where they want to topple governments, they topple them. And put technocrats in the place, they did it in Greece, they did it in Italy. If the Irish don't play ball, they'll do it in Ireland, they'll do it in Portugal. And they control these governments to which they lent, the banks have lent a lot of money. The task of the EU politicians is to control these governments. An Irish friend told me about a year and a half ago, he heard it from the, he got it from the horse's mouth that there's a cabinet meeting taking place of these people and someone said there's a big demand for giving more, a bit more money for culture and they voted it through and someone said oh my god but have you rung up Brussels to get permission you know for we need to get permission to do for any amount of money spent outside the agreement in the old days we used to call this colonialism and so we have this Euro-colonialism, 
dominated by the German banks and a few other banks today, and that is deeply anti-democratic. So democratizing nation states is extremely important, but it is equally important to wage a campaign from within Europe to democratize it, to say we don't accept your structures. Because you know what's happening in England is that most of the criticisms that are being made against the European Union are being made by UKIP. And I have to admit this, quite a few of them are correct. And the left then gets frightened of making these criticisms because this is a right-wing thing, but it is not a right-wing thing. It is a thing where they see a weak link in the armory of the mainstream parties and they go for it. But we have to be principled and say this is how the EU could be improved. A set of concrete measures and uh, left-wing economists from all over Europe are now working on an alternative economic plan from Europe of which I've seen a few chunks and it looks very good and we need to have an alternative political plan for different political structures in Europe which take into account the diversity of Europe, the needs of certain regions, and how these needs are expressed, not by the elite, but by populations, by citizens who have different needs in different parts of Europe. That is what a new European constitution should look like. And that is what we have to struggle for. And that is why the interest of quite a lot of Europeans has been focused on Scotland. Whenever I travel, they say, how come you're so involved? I said, because I'm an internationalist. Why shouldn't I be involved in Scotland? And what is happening there, then I explain. The campaign, the arguments, the fight, and then quite a lot of them say we need it here. And what we've seen happening in Spain, the Podemos, uh, person will tell you more about it later, is a transformation that these parties, and this is interesting to know, that the two big parties that have emerged, left parties, in Greece, Syriza, in Spain, Podemos, grew out of giant social movements, in the case of Podemos, the Indignados, and in the case of Syriza, from a left which had understood what needed to be done. And in both these countries, they were hostile to the left wing of the extreme center. They said, we can't move forward unless we break from the Spanish Socialist Party. In Greece, they said, we can't move forward unless we break from PASOK. And that is effectively, in a different way, what is going on in Scotland uh, today. And all the groups on the left who cling on to their respective social demo democratic parties are on the way down. The left party in Germany lost Berlin. The, the pirates won more seats than that. The uh, far left groups in Portugal hanging on to the coattails of the Social Democrats and saying they're going to vote for the Social Democratic president, lost four to five percentage points and came right down from 10 to three. It's because ordinary people, even people with no big political understanding, young people feel instinctively that these old parties have let them down. And so, <clears throat> Different processes coalesce in order to create new movements, stroke parties of a different type, which are completely structured in a totally different way than the parties or the groups coming out of them that we, both of us knew, have known so well <laughs> over the last three decades. And the time for that sort of a sectarian party is over. It hasn't worked, it's not going to work. But new movements, new structures that have been created are something Scotland will learn from and is teaching others to coming out of the campaign, the radical independence campaign. So all I can say is keep going, the struggle is not over yet, and as long as we're alive, we'll be with you. <laughs>